This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm so glad you're here. I want to thank all the people who've been writing me, emailing me. I've already gotten several just this month of July. I'm so glad to get to know who you are, where you listen, what's going on in your life, so that I know better what kind of podcast you might want to listen to. Thanks so much. I'll give you my email a little bit later. And it is confidential, by the way. Today, we're going to be talking about marriage or long-term partnership. Long-term commitment is the focus. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own personal life, how I met my husband, what the circumstances were, when right before our 24th wedding anniversary, I wrote a blog post that went, much to my amazement, wildly viral on the Huffington Post. We're going to talk about that blog post, whatever press reaction there was to it, and I'm actually going to read it to you. It just so happens, and you might have heard this on a previous podcast, but I have published this little blog post. And it's available in book form now. It's called Marriage is Not for Chickens. (laughs) But we're going to talk about the actual items in some detail. Basically what marriage is and what marriage is not. And then lastly, we'll hear from a listener who wrote in about having crippling anxiety and a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder and wanted to know what she should do. So if you're considering a long-term commitment or marriage, you're already in a marriage or long-term commitment, this may just be the podcast for you to get your thoughts going and to get my perspective on what exactly is involved in marriage today. It wasn't too long ago that one of the trainers I work out with asked me, he was definitely kidding me, He said, now, just how old is that shirt you're wearing? This particular T-shirt, which used to be black, but now is definitely faded gray. I love it. It is a treasure of mine. The front is riddled with holes, kind of like jeans are these days. (laughs) Very popular. And you can barely read its logo, which announces the presentation of a stunning collection of Egyptian artifacts, highlighting the life and death of the Pharaoh Ramses. I bought this shirt 28 years ago, and the trainer is 29. (laughs) So I think it's a relic, and I love it. It actually brings back a lot of memories, fun times with my nephews who I actually took to the show, and then the year was 1989, and that's the same summer I met my now husband. And let me tell you, it was far from love at first sight. (laughs) I met him at my now aunt's home. We ate tacos And he shook my hand when we left. He was a Yankee after all. (laughs) Not even a hug. So again, my now aunt invited me one more time to join them for dinner while he was in town. I don't remember the meal like I remember the tacos, but I did laugh a lot. And they asked me to play the guitar, something I had not done since high school. The only song I could remember was Puff the Magic Dragon. And uh, by the way, I did not know what that song was really about when I sang it in high school. I was such a nerd. My future spouse didn't call for a couple of days, but I guess you have to take into account that I'd sung a song about smoking weed. But he did call finally and ask me out. And then the rest is history. We were inseparable that following weekend. Even now when I drive home, and certainly we've been through rough patches, but when I see his car when I get back from a long day at work, I smile. Because after 27 years of marriage now, I'm glad to come home to him. I'm hoping we look a little better than the shirt, (laughs) but it may kind of be a toss-up. But right before our 24th wedding anniversary, so almost three years ago now, I wrote a post about marriage. I really didn't set out to write anything particularly more than a regular blog post. I'd been blogging at that point a couple of years And my husband was about to have an operation, not a life-threatening operation, but a very serious operation. And I wanted to somehow honor how I felt about him and our marriage and say what I'd learned as a therapist. Much to my amazement, as I said a few minutes ago, it went wildly viral on the Huffington Post. 
200,000 likes and 53,000 shares. I thought my laptop was going to blow up. And many people contacted me either through email or just in the comments below. How could they get a copy? Now, kind of interesting to me was that even though this post went viral on the Huffington Post, it didn't create media attention. I remember about the same time a blogger friend of mine wrote a post which appeared on the Huffington Post about that she regretted not going back to work after she had her children. And people either screamed that her children should be taken away from her or they applauded her that she was talking about the sacrifice of parenthood. And it just created a furor. She was on national news and all that kind of thing, which was great. She's a beautiful writer. Her name is Lisa Heffernan. And she writes for the website Grown and Flown. But it was interesting to me that obviously that sparked a lot of attention. But my little (laughs) viral post on what marriage is and what it isn't never did. And I don't want to sound like I'm grousing because I didn't get media attention, but I just noticed it. It was curious to me. So I really didn't do anything else with it. I was just delighted that it had done well and reached a lot of people. And then I started thinking about how I could make it into book form. I don't know if any of you know anything about self-publishing, but it's interesting. And so I worked with two photographers over literally almost two and a half years, trying to find pictures that would really go well with my words. I didn't want pictures of people. Some of those pictures you see with blog posts that look very staged and all that kind of thing. I didn't want that. So a high school friend of mine named Deborah Payne Strauss and then my editor out in California, Christine Mathias, worked together to provide these wonderfully evocative pictures, which, of course, I can't show you, I'm sorry to say, but I believe that they deepen the meaning and the poignancy or the laughter that my words hopefully invoke. It's a little book that states very simply, 12 Things Marriage Is and 12 Things Marriage Is Not. It's meant to be like an anniversary present or an engagement present, maybe for an anniversary or just to tell somebody that you love them and you're glad you're married. It literally takes only a few minutes to read, but I'm hoping that its meaning far outweighs its actual girth. Just to let you know, we've kept the cost as low as we could. I think I make 73 cents (laughs) each copy, and it's under $10. So you can give it as a remembrance to someone you love, underneath his or her pillow, tuck it into a gift basket, or give it as an accompaniment to a bed, bath, and yawn card, something like that. What it's meant to do, again, is to acknowledge what each of you accomplish every day by being together with respect and kindness. So, to pique your interest, I thought I might read it to you. Again, it's not going to take long. (laughs) It's not a tome. And if you get curious, maybe you'll pick up a copy just to see the entire package. 12 Things Marriage Is Not Marriage is not for chickens. It's hard work. Marriage is not a dictatorship. You don't want to win all the time because that would mean your partner would lose all the time. Marriage is not rocket science. The principles are simple. Kindness, respect, and loyalty. Marriage is not old-fashioned. I think Brangelina had just gotten married at the time, and so that was pertinent to the time. Of course, now that's no longer. Marriage is not in and of itself stimulating. The two of you can get in a rut. You have to keep things fresh. Marriage is not about collecting things. The joys of marriage aren't tangible. You live them. Marriage is not for the impatient. Some of the best stuff takes a while to develop. You have to stick around to find out. Marriage is not a place for contempt. That will ruin any chance of true intimacy or trust and dissolve the hope that once might have existed. Marriage is not a 24-hour repair shop. Your partner isn't supposed to meet your every need. Some of those you may have to take care of through friendships or hobbies. Marriage is not self-sustaining. It will not thrive on its own. If all you focus on is the kids, you are making a mistake. Marriage is not boring. Two lives woven together can be exciting. There's something about watching someone very different from you live their life. You learn from that. 
Marriage is not without conflict. Knowing how to disagree and work through anger and disappointment is key to feeling true closeness. Other relationships may end due to anger, not marriage. In fact, I'll expound on this a little bit. When you think about being angry and disappointed in your spouse, and yet you maintain your commitment, where else does that happen in relationships? Friendships end. People don't speak to relatives. When they get mad enough at them, they cut them out of their lives. But marriage, when it's a good marriage, when it's a healthy marriage, contains anger, but it's not governed by it. So what is marriage? Here's what I wrote, the 12 things marriage is. Marriage is the potential for an intense, deep, and diverse intimacy. Marriage is trusting someone has your back, always. Marriage is realizing that you have been seen in your worst times and you are still loved. You feel incredible gratitude for that gift and give it back. Marriage is hearing some story over and over, but every time it makes you laugh so hard that you're left gasping for breath. Marriage is getting teary-eyed together. Marriage is thinking about the other one not being there anymore and not being able to think about it. Marriage is getting irritated by the things that always irritate you, have irritated you for years, will irritate you for more, and tolerating it because it's way overbalanced by the good stuff. Marriage is not being able to wait to get home to share some little something. Marriage is wishing you were the one having the operation or illness, not your partner. Marriage is about fighting more fairly, learning how to apologize, to listen, and to find resolution. Marriage is about vulnerability, giving someone the right to hurt or disappoint you while simultaneously giving that someone the opportunity to bring you tremendous joy and laughter. And lastly, marriage is a promise, a vow, to try the hardest you have ever tried in your life for a chance to achieve a personal integrity not found anywhere else. It's certainly not that people who never marry can't have integrity. That's not the meaning of that at all. But there is something about feeling like you're good at marriage. You are competent. You have a healthy marriage. I'm not sure where else you can find that. It's been a real joy to put this little gift book together. And I hope if you're interested, you'll check it out on Amazon. Marriage is not for chickens. (laughs) By the way, I don't think divorce is for wimps either. (laughs) I've been through two of those. The link to the book on Amazon will be in the show notes. And thanks for listening. So here's an email from a listener. Hello, I'm one of your podcast listeners, and I'm listening to your PhD episode, where you ask for some detail about why we listen and who we are. I'm a 32-year-old female, and then she gives me where she lives. I became aware of your podcast through a Facebook post. I've been listening to your podcast and I enjoy it very much. For most of my adult life, I have struggled with anxiety. In the last few years, I would say my anxiety has at times become crippling and it's getting worse. I had my first panic attack a few years ago. My panic attacks are so severe, I have fainted and are hyperventilated. After listening to your podcast, I also think I may display the characteristics of perfectly hidden depression. I've also suffered from depression in my past and been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to decide if I need help getting to the root of my anxiety and finding better ways to cope. Thank you for your podcast episodes. Well, first, let's talk a little bit about what generalized anxiety disorder is. Here are the symptoms. Persistent worrying or obsession about small or large concerns that's completely out of proportion to the impact of the event. Inability to set aside or let go of worry. Inability to relax, restlessness, and feeling keyed up or on edge. Difficulty concentrating or the feeling that your mind goes blank. Worrying about excessively worrying. Distress about making decisions for fear of making the wrong decision. 
carrying every option in a situation all the way out to its possible negative conclusion. The what ifs. What if this happened? What if that happened? Difficulty handling uncertainty or indecisiveness. And then there's some physical symptoms as well you can imagine if you live your life like this. Fatigue, irritability, muscle tension, trembling, being easily startled, trouble sleeping, sweating, nausea, and headaches. This is a terrible disorder to have. Just constant worry, constant agitation, constantly predicting bad things and dreading the future. Now, just to be clear, let's talk a little bit about what a panic attack is, because the two can coexist. A panic attack is the abrupt onset of intense fear or discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes and includes at least four of the following symptoms. Palpitations or a pounding heart, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort. A lot of people think they're having a heart attack when they're actually having a panic attack. Nausea, feeling dizzy, chills or heat sensations, paresthesia or numbness or tingling, derealization or feelings of unreality like this isn't happening to me, I don't even feel like myself, fear of losing control or going crazy, or a fear of dying. People with panic also have to have a really good medical evaluation because those symptoms mimic those of heart disease, thyroid problems, breathing disorders, and other kinds of issues. So you really need to be checked out by a physician. I actually talked about panic disorder in the second episode of Self Work, and more recently I talked about having experienced panic disorder myself in episode 25. So if this young woman has been diagnosed with both generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder, that means anxiety is really governing her life. So here's my response. It sounds like your psyche is giving you lots of signs that something is out of whack. That may be why the panic is getting worse. In some ways, I like to think of panic as the body or the unconscious sending signals to the mind. You've got to pay attention to something, and you're not. You've got to pay attention. So I asked her, are you in therapy now? And if so, what kind of progress are you making? If you have any trauma in your past, then EMDR might be very helpful to you with a therapist who knows and has been trained in this technique. It can be very effective with anxiety. Let's talk about EMDR a little bit. It's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. I got trained in it a couple of years ago. It's a fascinating technique. It uses what's called bilateral stimulation, meaning you're actually either moving your eyes back and forth as you follow someone's finger signals. Some people use tapping on one leg at a time. Other people use actually electronic signals that you hold in your hands. But it is an attempt to reconnect painful memories with their emotions, with their thoughts, and with what your body was going through. Often, we have detached those things from the actual memory, and we're just overwhelmed by emotion, anxiety, sadness. So EMDR basically is about reattachment, reconnection, and doing that safely. You need to find someone who's been trained in EMDR, not necessarily someone who's just read a book. But it can be very effective. And if you have anxiety, I really suggest you Google it and see what you think. It's been well-researched and well-documented. But of course, each therapist is going to do it a little differently. As I've said before on several podcasts, you really need to make sure you have a good relationship with your therapist, that he or she knows what they're doing and that you feel solidly about them. You feel understood, you feel that she or he's paying attention to you, and that you're making progress. So I hope you've enjoyed this podcast a little bit different today, because I wanted to share with you what so many people have told me that they enjoyed hearing or reading. Marriage is not for chickens. You can contact me in a whole lot of ways. I have a website, drmargaretrutherford.com. I have a Facebook page by that name as well. And by the way, there is 
a Facebook event planner, organizer, on my Facebook page right now, I'm going to be doing a book signing on July the 20th here in Fayetteville. So if you're local, I would love to have you come by. I'll be serving wine and hors d'oeuvres between 5.30 and 7.30. I'd love to meet you. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And as I've already said, it is very confidential. And if I do happen to use something that you've written here on the program, I will obviously delete your name and any information that might alert people to who you are. Unless you tell me you don't care. (laughs) I'm on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Margaret. And of course, I would love for you to give the show a rating and review. It's how iTunes decides where to put it in the lineup, the number of ratings and reviews and how positive they are. So I'd really appreciate it if you take the two or three minutes it takes to do that. I've included the link on how to do that in the show notes. And of course, subscribe. That's real motivation and helps me realize that this show is important to people to hear on a regular basis. Thanks so much. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work. Self Work.